Well, today I'm with my good mate, Joel Melgate, the pastor of Curate Church, and we're talking about burnout and the road out of uh, burnout and what you need to do to um, come back from feeling overwhelmed. So yeah, let's get into it. Well, hey, Joel, welcome to the podcast, mate. Thanks. It's good to be here. It's great to have you here. Um, yeah, so I thought it'd be really good since you had burnout to mm. talk about burnout. Because I know that, um, as I was saying before, not a lot, I don't know a lot of people that have had burnout, but I I know a lot of people feel anxious. Mm. There's a real, high, real heightened sense of anxiety, you know, the, the whole COVID thing. There's a, there's a real um, sort of a bad feel in the air. Um, and so I thought it'd be really good just to, um, if you're okay, just sort of talk about that um, and just see if, draw out whether there's some lessons that sort of we can all apply. Absolutely. Um, so just, man, tell me about it. You, I think you had a burnout experience, was it a couple of years ago now? Yeah, I think I can pinpoint the time where I was sitting with my psychologist and he told me, hey, you're burnt out. Right. And I'd, I didn't want to hear those words because I guess partly in my role as a, as a pastor and, you know, a big part of that has been an example to yeah. people it feels like failing. Yeah. Um, wow. But also because I feel like people use the words very lightly. They yep. self-diagnose. Yep. So I think my response to him was at that time was like, no, I'm probably browned out. You know, like <laughs> yeah, just yeah. with this, a holiday, yeah. some changes, yeah, yeah, yeah. fix this. And uh, he was like, no, this is this is worse than that. Wow. So that was in, uh, that's probably in mid, or well, probably around this time in 2020, yeah, so yeah. two years ago. Yeah. Um, but... And what I've been learning about it since then is that's not really when I got burnt out. Mm. You know, there's years before that. Yeah. And uh, there's a great book called Beyond Burnout that helps you understand the different phases. You yeah. know, so that's probably where I'm hitting critical phase four. Right. You know? okay. yeah. <laughs> but I probably was in phase three for wow. maybe two years before that and phase two before that. And mm -hmm. so learning some of those warning signs has sort of helped walk yeah. back out of it. So there's that sense where it's not just this instant sort of like give up, but it's pressures build. So what, so what did it feel like? You know, what 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 were the initial sort of feelings that you were the psychologist? You were talking to yeah. psychologists about it, and they were like, "Yeah, yeah, no, that's burnout." Yeah, I think um, I've always been a very motivated mm. person. Uh, always been able to see the future, yep. strive for the future. Yes. No problem getting up in the morning. Love mm. what I do. And it felt like just hitting a wall. Right. Um, and I've hit, uh, you know, we all hit walls. We mm. have days, we have moments, we have weeks or months mm. even. But this felt like uh, a lot bigger and a lot of a thicker wall. And, mm. you know, a few coffees wasn't going to yeah. fix it. Yeah. You know, a, a, a good long weekend wasn't going to fix it. It just didn't matter what mm. I did. I changed my diet. I did different things. And I just found myself still at this, this wall. Mm. Um, another way to liken it would be like, you know, I know nobody drives a manual anymore, mm. but yeah. I still grew up driving one, and I yeah. know you would have. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Real men yeah, know how right. to drive them. Yeah. Um, that's a concerning thing as fathers, whether or not our kids will know how to drive them. Very much so. But yeah. it's like only having first gear. Yeah. And so it didn't matter what I could do. I couldn't change up to second. I couldn't change mm. up. It just I could rev harder, yeah. but not go much faster wow. and not have any capacity, which was a shock. Um and uh, mm. yeah, not feeling like you had anything wow. to give. So that you talk about that wall, just to uh, understand that was was there a sense there that, um, because we all, I guess, every day in our life, hey, there's these leaders are facing barriers mm. that we're trying to conquer every day. Was there a sense that you just didn't have what you needed to? face What you needed to face? Yeah, and on every level, like on a holistic level, physically. Oh, for the first time was struggling to get out of bed in my life. Wow. Um, you know, even things that were life-giving. We all go through seasons where we're perhaps too stressed and even life-giving things don't give us life, but yeah. it didn't matter how much, how many walks I went on. If I played golf, I went surfing, whatever. I didn't mm. even have the energy to do those things. Mm. Uh, emotionally, um, I felt very separated from myself, uh, very numb but yeah. fragile at the same time. Yeah. Um, spiritually, I didn't feel connected. Yep. I didn't feel uh, in tune. Uh, relationally, I didn't want to see people. I didn't, you know, the thought of needing to have people over for dinner or just catch up with somebody yeah. or sort of like, I was, 
I mean, I was in the I'm in the people business, mm, so yeah, to yeah. speak. So yeah. that's part of the fatigue, yeah. you know, yeah. contributor. Um, so things that would normally love and life giving all of a sudden aren't and can't do anything to. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we all need to understand the boundary. There's boundaries to break through and there's boundaries to respect. Yeah. And uh, clearly in this season, it was about learning to respect them after spending many years breaking through all of them. Yeah. Yeah, because I guess it would be easy for, like you talk about, you know, overdose, people diagnosing themselves. And I think we can all think of people that maybe have less capacity than what we imagine we have, than what we have at that very easily um, push themselves beyond that. But so what we know of you is a real high capacity person driving a big organisation, lots of staff, big volunteer thing. And so um, the responsibility of that is resting mm. on you. Um, how did that feel after that diagnosis in terms of your ability? How was it feeling in terms of your ability to work and achieve? Yeah, well, I felt, I guess I felt like I was failing. Really? felt like it, in my role and who I'm supposed to be in this community, mm. I'm not supposed to be in this place. I'm supposed to be an yeah. example yeah. of, uh, you know, whether you just look at it from an example framework, I'm supposed to be the person that knows how to do life well with the answers. Wow. If you look at it through, um, you know, just the responsibility framework, mm. I have things that I need to do yeah. that other people can't do and I can't do them right mm. now. Wow. Um, so on all sort of fronts, and then all of the fears of will I ever be, you know, will I ever have the capacity I once had again yeah. or have, am I permanently broken in yeah, some yeah. way or have I changed in some way that is, wow. you know, unfixable. So what's your view on that? now because would you say would you say that you're post burnout that you're like yeah baby i'm back or is it do you think that's ever the case or i think if i'm i'm on the other side is and i'm on the way out yeah. you know how how far can a dog run into the forest mm. we're well, halfway and then it's running out again right. and it's sort yeah, of yeah, like yeah. that yeah. that sort of thing i feel like i've i've gone into the middle of it yeah. i'm not in the middle of it anymore yeah. but i'm not fully out of yeah. the woods and uh but there's been some significant shifts along the way of mm. feeling like oh physically you know i might be 80 to 90 percent of where i was yeah uh you know of wet me at my best yeah and that feels like a hundred percent but yeah. i have to remember yeah. it's not you yeah. know or yeah. and emotionally and spiritually yeah. and these sort of things like they are come back a million miles and there's been certain turning points along the yeah. way but i i'll if you'd asked me six months ago, I'd mm. be like, I'm definitely not out of it. But yeah. wow. it's amazing just what another six months has done to go, oh, I feel like I'm coming out of yeah. it. Yeah. And I, I want to circle back around in a minute and ask you what some of those things that you have done, the things that you've changed to help you on that, that journey. But I'd really, the question that I want to ask is, how did Katie, how did Katie and your kids respond to the Joel who didn't want to turn up anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think the kids in some way actually really loved it because yeah. um, I was at home a lot more. Yeah. Um, and as I got through the worst of sort of feeling depressed mm. and uh, feeling emotionally overwhelmed and just overall down about it all, yeah. as I got through the worst of that, I was more present. Yeah. And um, I wasn't trying to focus on as many things. Mm. So I, I know having talked with them about it, they're like, Oh, we just we like having dad around more, yeah, right. um, which is uh, nice and sobering all at the same time. Mm -hmm. Katie um, has just been incredible. I mean, mm. the secret to a good marriage is marrying the right person, right? Yeah. That's where it yeah, all yeah. starts. Yeah. And I know you'd oh, know yeah. that. Yes. Yeah. And so her her um, flexibility, mm. her gracefulness in the season to realise, um, hey, Joel's not doing well. Mm. That's going to mean are more of a burden for her uh, mm. in the season because it didn't just mean I couldn't, I, I wasn't up to it, not only in church and in the organisation, the community, I wasn't up to it at home. Yep. I didn't have the energy for the, the normal daily chores and mm. normal daily life as well. And so that put a lot more of a burden on her as well as her to bring the intentionality to our family that sometimes I would bring. Yep. I mean, she's a great um, mum anyway, yep. but it just it asked a lot more of her and thankfully she was willing to give it yeah. over that time. Yeah, because I, I know that when 
you know, we're, we're constantly culture making and when we turn up, you know that, you'll know it from when you turn up at work that the vibe you bring is, mm. you know, it's the vibe in the room and if there's one bad egg bringing the bad vibe um, can really sour the feel of the place. And that must, and I know that at home for me, if I turn up bad at home, it quickly rubs off and can affect the feel. So I imagine Katie would have had to be incredibly intentional to to keep things feeling okay at home. Yeah, absolutely, because yeah. I wasn't exactly contributing to the positive vibes of the home right. or the yeah. light vibes yeah. of the home, yeah. um, but also her to give me the grace mm. to um, not be on me about everything as yeah. well and be like, yeah. well, that's not going to help if yeah. being home doesn't feel like a safe place. Yeah. She had to be intentional and seek her own support network as she supported me, mm. and I think like that was something we okay. thought about quite early and oh. as we've – helped other people where, you know, one of the, either the husband or the wife might be going through some sort of fatigue or something similar. It's like, well, the other half needs help and support too. And so how how are we going to structure that, whether that's mentally or spiritually or just practically, yeah. you know, with, uh, you know, getting a cleaner or whatever yeah, it is yeah, to yeah. to help share the burden a bit. That's really wise. Yeah, that's I think that's really wise, um, the, the idea that, you know, when one person's struggling, you'd naturally do it like if you had, broken both your legs or were bedridden or something, people would come mm. with food and help Katie out. But um, it can be so easy in our macho sort of culture to go, ah, burnout, you know, it's just having a bad week or something. Mm. <laughs> but um, the fact that um, actually people, we all need to consider that more seriously and come around and support when people are having mental health issues. It sounds bad when you say mental health issues. Yeah, well, that's Doesn't what they are. Yeah. Battles, Battles, challenges. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think like a lot of a lot of what we're learning about even mental health, right, is that it, mental health, you know, particularly when it comes to pres- depression and anxiety, mm-hmm. is like a is like the engine light on our car. Right. It's not the problem. It's telling us there's a problem. Mm-hmm. It's telling us there's something fundamentally not working well in our life. And this is our brain and our body's way of coping or like letting us know. Now, one of the problems is is if we just think, oh, this is just a mm. this is just a problem in my neurology. I'll take some pills to fix the we we ignoring that's like putting some tape over yeah. the engine light. Yeah. And eventually it's going to come back and another problem, another light's gonna yeah. pop on. Yeah. Burnout is very much like that. Mm. As we go through the different stages, the difference, like, you know, you got stage one cancer and stage two. Mm, it's like the mm. same thing. Like there are early signs. Yep. There are things. And we journey back out the same stages we journey uh, in. You know, you don't yeah. skip out yeah. all of a sudden. You're yeah. not cured. Yeah. You walk out. Yeah. But it's the same thing. It's it, it's telling us there's something fundamentally wrong. Mm. Or there might be multiple things fundamentally wrong about how we are uh, navigating life how we are mm. handling life, how we're organizing life, how we're carrying life yep. in ourselves. It's either that or we've just been through some extreme trauma. Yeah. And that's the same with mental health. Sometimes it's like, well, somebody's died. We've gone mm. through something. We've gone through a difficult season. Mm. We've led our business through COVID, mm. whatever it is. Mm. And that took a lot. Mm. And so our body's taking time mm. to get back. Were there any specific triggers for you? Do you go, oh, yeah, it was because of this? I, I think that the straw that broke the camel's back for me, like mm. the last uh, thing was that March 2020 to sort yep. of June 2020. Yep. Nothing wrong with the the lockdowns or anything like that in the sense of it wasn't that. It yep. wasn't being stuck at home. Mm. It wasn't, uh, in fact, that was sort of nice for a change. Yeah. Um, and it was nice to have my, you know, travelling schedule cleared for the first time in many <laughs> years. Like there was some things really nice about it, but the the pressure of, uh, leading our church and the way I carried that pressure mm. and leading our staff trying to do a really good job trying to care for mm. thousands of people yeah um the way I carried that you know in hindsight is the thing that just uh-huh. you know tipped me over the yeah. edge it was the last straw but there have been issues in yeah, the way yeah. I was leading for right. years yeah that, yeah interesting um that it was interesting eh, how all of a sudden our visions and our missions and our prep, you know, the things that drive us were just stopped. And then you had to decide whether you had enough energy to push through, to kick it, 
the momentum, getting the momentum back is so hard. Mm. Um, and I'm not saying any of that was part of it, but I know for me at the time, um, I, I know I felt that a little bit. Like, damn, you know, I've got to, I've got to put, going to push harder even than I have before. Yeah, um, that's right. It, I mean, if it takes a lot of energy to walk into your workplace as a certain type of person mm. to set the tone, to set the attitude, mm. to set the sort of, you know, brand identity in yeah. that sense, and how mm. we live together. How much more so to set that over Zoom? Yeah, oh. from home to home, yeah. or or you know to try and we realise we're at there's so many things we didn't control, but mm. we could try and influence, and it took a lot of energy to try and influence yeah. those things. Are you a natural like people person? Because I, I know for me, I have to be very intentional about being relational. Uh, it's not natural by any stretch. And I think a lot of men relate. You know, we struggle to communicate struggle to be relational beings. And so if, I, if I'm if i going to intentionally affect a culture, I need to act, be highly intentional about it. How about yourself? I would say, I would, am I a people person? Yes and no. Uh, so like yes is in all of my core motivations are people orientated. Yeah. Um, that I deeply care about people. Mm. I want to see people do well. But my skill set Mm. is not necessarily EQ. Right, uh, yeah. My skill set is strategy yes. and vision and mm. thinking and learning. Mm. Um, uh, so the reason I do all of those things is because I deeply care about people yeah. and are motivated by people. Yep. But on a day-to-day experience, I have to mm. be very intentional for those people to feel cared for yeah, by yeah, me. Yeah. Um, yep. um, you know, yeah, I would say I deeply care, but people often don't feel cared for yeah. by me. And so I have to really think about that and yeah. um, make sure that what's most important to me is coming out in the way I practice life. Yeah. Um, I like, I guess, yeah, I like to do things. I like to do things now. I like to make sure yeah. things are done properly. Yeah. And uh, it's easy to for the task to be <laughs> to feel more important than the person that yeah. you're right in front of in those times. Yeah, I get that. I get that totally. And so talk about, uh, if you can, the things you mentioned before about the, the way you were leading, being part of the problem. Is there anything there that you can happily yeah, talk about? Yeah, well, I think there's some macro cultural things that probably everybody listening that I would uh, understand as familiar that mm. were affecting me. Right. You know, And so we could start there because it's it applies to everybody, I yeah. think. One of the things that shifted in the workplace culture of the last 20 years, certainly, is we've shifted from hard work to stressful work. Explain that. Well, nobody minds working hard. Well, some people do, yeah. but I think most people, yeah. you know, we're, we're not allergic to hard work. We're yeah. happy to do hard work, but mm. stressful work's quite different. Mm. And this is the way that our a lot of our careers have moved from things that are quite... Um, more sim- simple and mm. have become more complex. And right. so as less people are involved in simple work, that is hard, good, honest right. work, and involved in very complex work mm. with complex management systems in complex cultural companies with mm. all sorts of different political, managerial, task, yeah. customer, client pressures. Yeah. It's no longer just hard work. We have to recognize it's stressful work. Yeah. Okay. So when we go to work for you know, eight or 10 hours a day or whatever we do, mm. there's certain types of fields that some of us are going to be in that aren't just hard, they're stressful. Mm. Yeah. We're constantly dealing with pressure, yeah. um, which the person collecting our rubbish, probably it's just hard work. It's it. not stressful work. Yeah. Okay. So more of us are involved in stressful types of yes. work. That's going on. We're hyper-connected, mm. you yeah. know. Yeah. The thought of taking your computer with you on holiday would have been completely foreign 20 years ago mm. you know laptops were only just fresh mm, there's only right. just so mm. it wasn't even going to come mm. well now we take our mm. our laptop in the form of our phone with mm, us right. and this constant connectivity mm. is um puts us on high alert mm. so as far as our system you know whether we're in rest or reflect or within you know fight or flight yeah we find ourselves for longer periods of time as people in mm. natural or low-level fight-or-flight situations. Right. Stressful work, so yeah. we're in fight-or-flight all yeah. day. 
Then we go home and because our phone's in our pocket or mm-hmm. our phone's near us or our phone's on our bedside, our body isn't actually defragging from yeah. that state yeah. um, as often as it needs to. There's nothing wrong with being in stressful situations, but prolonged stressful situations without enough rest and reflect yeah. uh, to get into that parasympathetic state mm. means that our body's constantly getting into deficit. And eventually it'll put up its hand and say, no more. Mm. And that that can come in the form of anxiety, depression, fatigue, you yeah. know, all of these sort of burnout sort of things. So I think those are the macro things that all of us are dealing with. And yeah. if we don't deal with those two things well, yeah. um, the the different things going on for me that I'd add to that would have been I was probably taking too much of the burden of leadership on my own shoulders right. in the sense of the way I was carrying it in myself was like it all depended on me. Yeah. Um, ironic coming from a, a spiritual framework where it should really all depend on God. Yeah, but yeah. The, that just shows how subtle it is for all of us. Yes. That, um, Yeah, and that is, it's funny, there's only one story in the Bible mm. about burnout, and it's from exactly this situation. Yeah. It's a story about Elijah. He's burnt out. He doesn't want to do his job anymore that God's asked him to do. Uh-huh. And it comes out why he's burnt out. Mm-hmm. God's feeding him. God's taking care of him. That's what I love. He takes care of him in the yeah. burnout. But... um when he starts asking him questions about, you know, why he's in a situation, he goes, well, because I'm the only one. Wow. And and yeah, I love okay. the voice of the Lord goes, no, there's 7,000 yeah. that I've preserved in my service. Wow. So he's thinking it all rests on him. No yeah. wonder he's burnt out. Yeah. And I was like, man, it all rests on me. Yeah. And, uh, and I think we can all have our own ways of doing that, okay. carrying it. To, it might be in our marriage. We're carrying yeah. too much. Yeah. It might be in our family. It might be with a friend and we're in a rescuing situation or yeah. it could be in our businesses or whatever. Mm. Um, we need to make sure that we're only carrying what's ours to carry. Wow. Let alone just habits. Yeah. You know, if I'm, if I'm working consistently, mm. you know, too much. Yeah. Everybody's too much is slightly different. Yes. Um, you know, my probably good amount of work each week is somewhere in the 50 to 55 hours. That's yeah. probably like my sweet spot. Any yeah. less, I'm probably being negligent. Yeah. Um, and any uh, more, I'm um, um, unsustainable. Mm-hmm. So I had unsustainable. Yeah. Um, Interesting, man. So how you, how are you carrying less? How have you, what do you do? What do you do initially? And how are you now carrying less than you did before? Yeah, so we've already talked about the family side and the work side. I had yeah. to meet with my board and, you know, call them up, get them together and say, yeah. hey, here's where I'm at. Mm. Um, I don't think I can keep going. How would you like to proceed? <laughs> <laughs> oh. And I was thankful enough to have a good people on my yeah. board that go, well, you've given above and beyond for the best part of 14 years. Mm. Um, I think you've earned yourself some reduced responsibilities yeah. over this next season. I had a sabbatical that I'd already planned yeah. anyway. Yeah. So it was sort of like, well, how can we help you limp through to that? Or do mm. you just want to go now? Mm. Decided it was better to limp through and, and go with what's sort of planned. And so I had a great leadership team around me. Yeah. So in that, it was like the very quick, swift handover mm. to them. And uh, that I'd be checking in sort of one day a week, but otherwise I'd be just trying to take care of myself. A big part of my load was speaking every week, reducing some of those sort of performance pressures. Yeah. Um, yeah, those those things helped a lot in that initial thing. Yeah. Having a proper break yeah. was very important. Yeah. I came back a lot better, but I didn't come back ready to take on full responsibilities. And yeah. it's probably another year after that mm. of um, – having reduced responsibilities and I'm only sort of back to full responsibilities as of the last two or three months. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, you've, um, holiday break, um, and, um, drop, reduce responsibilities. Um, and how about, um, the computer in your pocket? Yeah. Well, for my three months, I mean, I, in different, times of my journey I've mm-hmm. had better boundaries and lesser boundaries yeah, you know we're yeah. I don't know we're all sort of like yeah, that right we have absolutely. times where we feel like yeah I'm doing good at this and other yeah. times you're like oh I need to delete some things yeah. and yeah. re reset a bit here mm-hmm. 
so I needed to get a lot more intentional about mm-hmm. things like that. I needed to get, um, you know, when I was on break, I, I actually got a new phone yeah. and a different number that only a few friends had oh, and, nice. you know, like those sort of things yeah. and just didn't actually download any of the social media or the news app yeah. and just like mm. didn't, so didn't use it really mm. and tried to holiday where there was no cell phone reception in our caravan, you know. <laughs> wow. yeah. um, so to take away this, yeah. the need for discipline too because sometimes you just run out of discipline, right? Yeah, it's, totally. it, that gets fatigued yeah. as well and so you need to set up your environment Sort of like if you struggle with eating the wrong foods, we'll stop buying them from the supermarket mm. and that's half of the battle. Then you know, can't grab them out of the pantry. It's interesting, eh, like that, because we, I think we um, we try to disconnect from the world by jumping on our phone and watching YouTube or mm. Facebook or whatever it is. And it's, it doesn't actually help. No, I, and I don't think we're trying to disconnect. I think we're trying to numb or we're trying right. to, we're actually looking for those quick fixes and lots of research coming out about the phone mm. about how it's actually rewiring mm. the way our brain fundamentally works and mm. scrolling down and, uh, mm. you know, these things, the, the dopamine hits and the notifications. And so we're sort of, mm. we're, we're like addicts, you know, looking for our next tiny thing of dopamine Um because it's easy, yeah. it's it's low hanging stuff. But we all know being on the other side of having spent an hour scrolling through something, and then on the other side of it realizing I didn't need to be doing that for the last hour. No, yeah, that it's actually not life giving. So it's sort of like short term minimal benefit, but mm. no long term benefit. Mm. It's it's no different than watching our favorite show. Mm. Like picking up a book mm. requires a lot more effort, mm. but we feel a lot better at the other end. Or yeah. coming home and putting something in the microwave or picking up some takeaways, mm. we get this short term, I think that's what I wanted. I wanted easy so mm. I could sit down on the mm. couch and just relax. Mm. But actually probably spending an hour mm-hmm. cooking something probably would have you feeling more relaxed at the end, going yeah. slow, being more present. Yeah. Um, so what would you say? Do you, Would you say your um, phone use uh, is different today than it was 20 20- it was. Yeah, I'd, I'd hope so. Yeah. Um, I I try my best to have the habit of turning my phone off mm-hmm. um, when I get home as much as possible. Yeah, um, okay. at least wow. between those sort of like critical family yeah. hours. Yeah. I don't do it every day, but yeah. I try Each to. Try. Yeah. Um, I normally have one day a week where it's just off. Yeah. Um, okay. And wow. so try to have these things. A, yeah. yeah. I mean, when I'm doing it really well, I think when it's going the best for me, I'm actually turning my phone off when I pull in my driveway at home yeah. and I'm turning it back on when I'm leaving yeah. in the morning wow. and actually just having this whole time where it, it can't yeah. get to me. I was um, talking to a mate. In fact, it was on a, a podcast and he was talking about how he, um, it's not like a boundary. It's not like a, a boundaries with the kids. It's actually like a family rule where, hey, in our house, we just don't have the phones up in our bedrooms. Mm. And he was telling me this. And when I was listening to it, I was like, mm, that's, that seems overly hard. I don't know if I could implement that in my home. And I was reading recently, I've just been um, reading through a report um, that I think it's Family First have, have produced. And um, it's talking, it, there's a graph of the an, um, anxiety between four, of 14 to 26 year olds, sort of back in 2012, that I think 3% of those children reported anxiety, whereas now it's like 20%. And I was thinking, man, that really correlates with about the time the phones were coming out and social media and stuff. So they weren't drawing that conclusion, and maybe I'm completely wrong by drawing that, but um, it's not uncommon now for kids to say they're anxious. Yeah, well, I think about it from a parent's perspective and go like, for my kid to get their license to drive a car, there's a process to mm. go through. There's rules, there's boundaries, there's a road code, there's a learner's a restricted or full, mm. there's an age there's yeah. all of these things. Why is that? Because cars are amazing tools, mm. but they can also cause a lot of damage. Right. And in this interconnected world, not just damage to ourselves, but damage to others. So we need to teach you to use this amazing tool well. Right. And there's a process. I think phones are the same. Phones can cause more damage in somebody's life than a car ever could. A car can kill you, but a phone can ruin your whole life. <laughs> and yeah. and, okay. and it's ruining people's lives yeah. every day. Yeah. When you look at all of the major... Uh, antisocial behavior, when you look at all the major mental health issues, when you look at a lot of the struggles around uh, even gender identity and these things, mm-hmm. the common thread in all of this is the amount of time people are on devices. Mm. And so 
that that doesn't account for every person's story, of course, mm. but there is this strong correlation yeah. here that people are, that are having certain types of issues often are yeah. uh, on their phones yeah. an exorbitant amount. And so how do we have our teach our kids boundaries? Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking as a mature adult who didn't mm. mature, I mean, someone else can decide <laughs> that, you know, <laughs> but as a mature adult who didn't grow up with this, if I struggle with it, how is my 10-year-old kid or my 12-year-old yeah. kid or my 15-year-old kid that hasn't got the pre-maturity built, mm. they're going to, it's going to be boundaryless if I don't help them form boundaries, oh. if I struggle as a parent. And yeah. so I think we need to be harder and harsher. I want to get, I've been researching online to get one of those like cell phone blockers, yeah, signal blockers that I can just put in yeah. my home and just certain times just turn, it, turn it on and then everybody's yeah. cut off. And like uh, just for some time. Yeah. Because I, I think I've, I've tried over here turning the internet off mm. or whatever, but they can just turn it back on. That's right. <laughs> or they go on their data or They're whatever tight, else. Whatever. Yeah. There's 4G on every phone anyway. So yeah. I like that. And part of me does not like that. Like the my big part of me is, as I said, when my mate suggested that, I'm like, no, that's terrible because I want my phone in my bedroom. You know, I, I watch a bit of Netflix and then read a book. And of course, bit, but, yeah. You know, we all do it. But the stats about anxiety and all that stuff, they're just so blatant that you just can't look at the way we're doing stuff and say, yeah, we, we, we're nailing it. We're not thriving, right? No. I think not. that's where the Amish have a lot to teach us. And most right. people's misunderstanding about the Amish is that they're anti-technology. Mm. They are not anti-technology. They have their faith values, their family values, mm. their convictions about what is a healthy life, a healthy family, a healthy community. Mm. And they assess every new technology for normally a period of a decade or two mm. before it is decided whether or not it will get adopted. And wow. it's decided whether or not it will get adopted based on will it enrich mm. our values or will it detract from them? And I think they are probably looking – so they don't drive cars, mm. not because they don't want to get places, but because what they recognise is when people drive cars, they live further away from people who are close to them, wow. which means they spend less time with them, Yeah, which means that families get more, more disconnected. Mm. And interesting or not, every, to be a part of an Amish, the Amish church, you actually have to – you have to spend two years outside of the Amish community, in their words, in the big bad world. Wow doing whatever you want, engaging in the fullness of society, and you can only be accepted as a full adult member of the church if you choose after that mm. to want to come back and choose the Amish way of life more mm. than the wow. what you've experienced. Mm. 70% of people return. Wow. Because I imagine <laughs> we're all sitting here listening or whatever, standing, walking, whatever it is that people are doing, thinking, well, what do we do? If we're not on our phones, what the heck? What are we going to do with our lives? Yeah. <laughs> just, just think, read, yeah. Be with. I mean, I remember as a kid, like many people listening to, would remember like when you had to wait at the doctors, or when you had to wait for someone to pick you up, or when you had to, mm. you just, you just waited. You just, what did you do? You just, your mind wandered, and mm. you, you read, and you're observant, mm. and you, you might actually talk things. to the person next year. You might do that. You mm. might flick through a magazine. Yeah. You might, and none of these things had dopamine attached to them. They had the ability to be present. Mm. Wow. Um, I wonder if. I mean, to go full circle, I wonder if so much of, you know, burnout's contagious, ironically, the research okay. is coming out. Wow. So Because like, attitude is contagious. Okay. So yep. not true clinical burnout, but people's sense of fatigue is yep. completely contagious. Yep. Okay. I wonder if so much of that comes back to, we don't know who we are. Mm -hmm. We don't know why we're here. We don't know uh, what our identity is. So we're looking for different things to give us that identity. And most people are looking to their workplace and their career and these things rather than giving them identity are just giving them stress. Yeah. And so they're becoming more and more disillusioned. Mm. We're calling it fatigue, but mm. really it's just overwhelmed yeah. or it's just lost. It's just a sense of meaninglessness. Everything's yeah. meaningless yeah. Um, rather than something to live for. And um, I guess that's when we look for our work to give that to us. It's, it's always going to get to a point at some point where that's yeah. taken away or stripped back for what it is at some point. Oh, and you can see it, you know, they call it the great resignation um, or the quiet quitting, I think, is another yeah. one where people turn up to work but don't really want to, don't actually turn up to work. Yeah. You know? And part of that, I think, 
I, I that stuff terrifies me. Like, do we need better healthy workplace conversations? Of course we yes. do. Yeah. Absolutely. There's no doubt about it. Can we do a better job in most workplaces? Mm. I'm sure we can. Mm. But the answer isn't now giving my minimum. Yeah, no. Because um, it doesn't matter what, if you look at it through the, the mm. lens of just a competitive industry, yeah. the business will die mm. if the employees have that attitude and then nobody will have a job. Yeah. Um, if you look at it through the sense of anybody who's done anything worthwhile doing in their mm. life, it caused them to give more, not less. Yeah. And we should be doing things that want us to give more, yeah. not less. Yeah, that's right. How hopeless is it if you decided there's no hope and I'll just turn up and... Yeah. Okay. Like I tell you, I don't want to hire anyone that has that attitude. Yeah, no, nobody does. Okay, so phone's a problem. Um, that's a hard hit, even for me. Um, I, you know, we at this, for me too. Yeah, I mean, we, we we had a funny situation this week where we um, I tried putting screen time passwords on my kids because we homeschool, mm -hmm. so they're at home all the time, you know. And sometimes Mum's supervising, sometimes she's not, and we think they're doing school and we bring up screen time, and they've been on YouTube for six hours, and you think, well. Hang on. And finally, um, one of my older sons actually helped me with the screen time thing out a bit more. So we've yeah. got that under control. But um, an old fellow like me, I just couldn't. They could keep bypassing whatever I'd set up. <laughs> I still don't know what I did wrong. But, um, uh, yeah, so it's, it's a battle. I think every parent feels that battle, whilst at the same time, we know the young mums that we work with have the battle of, you know, the feeding baby while watching mm. – TikTok, you know, mm. um, and so they're not even engaging with the child. Yeah. Not all of them. I'm not saying everyone yeah. mum does We're not this, engaging but... in the things that are being human, right? Yeah. Oh. Um, so back to burnout, then what um, What would be key lessons? And we've talked about one, the phones. That's obviously a massive, a massive, this, this being able to just take some moments to disconnect is what you're saying. Yeah. That can be a holiday. That can be just the way you manage your phone use your computer use um did you disconnect from people entirely um or for a time yeah. like other than my family yeah yeah uh, obviously when we went away we just went away with just our yeah. family for a long time yeah um so i connected with the people that mattered most right. and are you connecting with them more now or different now? Uh, yeah definitely yeah yeah um more present uh more connected as a family i'd yeah. say yeah I think one of the issues is is that when we get fatigued, is it's like we end up with we become a bucket with heaps of holes in it. Right. It doesn't matter how many good things are actually in our life; yeah. they're actually all just draining through, and yeah. we don't have the sense of yeah. being full of, of those things. And mm. so we have to like look at w what are some of those holes mm. and how can we plug them. Like for me, I realise like I'm not being grateful for what I do have. Right. Yeah, I'm not being grateful yeah. for, and so the more I practice gratitude, the more Every morning, every mm -hmm. day, the more I try to look through the lens mm -hmm. of what what do I have that I can be thankful for, wow. um, it's like putting a cork in one of those holes. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the good things were always there, but mm -hmm. they weren't bringing any sense of fullness yeah. or joy to my life. But as I start corking them, yeah. it's like, oh, yeah. all of a sudden, wow. uh, it was there all along mm -hmm. and now I'm filled up by it. Do you think we're all useless at that? Because I know I'm terrible at being grateful. I'm very conscious I need to be more in, in, in my mornings. I'm trying to – some days it's like, oh, God, I've just got to find something to be thankful for. <laughs> and it's a stupid idea because I've just got so much. Yeah. And I just live with such blessing. It's just – I can't even – it's just incredible. But yeah. you wouldn't think it. Yeah. Well, it's probably <laughs> part of personalities like ours, right, where what can we do next? Yeah. What's the next? What can be fixed? What can be built? What could be? Yes sometimes causes us to undervalue mm. what is. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, we have to practice it. I, mm. I, we have to practice being thankful. Any tips? <laughs> I, I, I think we must recognise that we live in an entitled society. Yeah. That's coming at us from all angles, that mm. it's, it's rights over responsibilities. It's right. what does the world owe me? What yeah. does my boss owe me? Yeah. What do my family owe me? It's a blaming society, of course, yeah. an entitlement society. Is. Gratitude swims far against that current. Yeah, Because right. gratitude causes us to be thankful. And uh, so I, I think we can journal it. Mm. We can get our phone out yeah. and we can write 10 things we're thankful about before yeah. we open another app. 
before we can yeah. just have these things every yeah. time we go to the toilet yeah and we need to sit down on that mm. we could do these things mm. and so we can we can yeah. think whether we're you know if we're a spiritual person we can pray mm. if we're yeah. not we can just meditate on yeah. the things that we're thankful mm. for um and that everywhere mm. i mean that not hard you know where we live mm. who we know the opportunities where we've had the things that weren't so great in our lives but have made us stronger yeah you know it's all about how you look at things and so that sense of taking responsibility for how you look at things did did um did you were you when you burned out were you going that's everyone else's fault or I misunderstood or uh, I was or, not blaming other people. No. I think that's one thing that I was very conscious of that mm. like this is not the church's fault. Mm. It's not my board's fault, it's not my staff fault. Yeah. It's my responsibility. Yeah. Nobody was making me yeah. carry things the way I was carrying them, mm. live the way I was yeah. living, work the way yeah. I was working. If you're burnt out, if you blame. Now, would there be organizational factors or culture factors? Of course they will, but mm. blaming will never help. Those not, might mm. not be yours to fix right yeah. now. Yeah. Get yourself healthy before, you know, put your yeah. own oxygen mask on before yeah. you help somebody else yeah. is always the advice in the airplane. So take responsibility. Um, my turning point was being grateful. Yeah, I remember it distinctly. It was uh, between New Year's and Christmas and I was sitting in our caravan and I was, uh, I, I, was overwhelmed about what my future would look like, whether I would keep doing what I was da- doing. Mm. And I started to go, actually, I'm so thankful for what I've mm. been able to do. And as I started to be thankful, as I started to mm. be grateful, it started turning the tide on my yeah. outlook and my attitude. And I imagine it took some time for you to be able to actually be really, truly grateful as opposed to just faking yeah. great. Yeah, it was, it was deep deep depression before that yeah. you know <laughs> yeah. and then that was part of pulling yeah. myself out yeah. of that hopelessness yeah. of i can't see the future that was yeah. really a turning point yeah. and then and then choosing to stay with that outlook yeah well wow. so good man and so in terms of um the responsibility carrying this weight obviously as a, as a christian as a pastor it's you know relearning hey this is god's story that you've been a part of um from a leadership perspective, have have your team, have you, I mean, I imagine you've always been a, a delegator. I'm just, I don't know you in terms of your leadership style, but I'm, I may, I may, maybe a relegator. Relegator. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But you, you've you got a big team. Yeah. Um, I know there's, you're probably quite control, controlling, I was about to Some say. Some people would say that, yeah. Um, I'm trying to be less and less. Yeah. And I didn't mean that in a bad way, but. I'm specific about what I'm looking yeah. for. I think there's a difference between control and controlling and that at this you'll find strong I find when you look at strong leaders, you see that there's some there's some there's some things that they know I've got to I've got to I need to be in charge. I need to control that. There's some key sort of culture things and, and vision things that where you know you no, that's not right, it's gonna be like this. And yeah. that's just part of leadership, it's part of being a dad actually. We go, Hey, our family look doesn't do that. Yeah. You know, you can call that controlling or you can call that leadership yeah. sometimes. But I think con- the word Control is a can has so many bad things about it if it's controlling. Yeah, so I think I'm badly yeah. explaining any of that, but I don't know why I went there. But um, have you felt? Have you had to delegate more? How have you? Coped yeah, with I, had, that? I had to delegate a lot more. Had to let go of a lot of things, which was good and uh, part of the refining process of what are the few things that really matter mm. and some of that some things drifted mm. that I wasn't happy with right. and that helped me but have enough time to process it to go oh these things really matter mm. these are the things worth controlling yeah. or worth being very specific yeah. or uh, prescribed about how yeah. they are to be enacted by other people yes. and these are the things where there's lots of room for them to envision mm. and mm. innovate yeah. and be flexible yeah, um, yeah. The, I think in anything in an organization, the the less of those, the mm. better. Yeah. You know, it's like a peach. If you yeah. can have a strong core, yeah. you can have be fuzzy and lots of mm. room to explore on the outside. Yeah. Yeah. Better than being a watermelon where it's control everywhere and inside's hollow. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's good, man. Well, I think I think there's heaps in there. Just as a parting shot, um, and I haven't prepared you for this, but is there anything when you think of dads sitting at home? walking, running, whatever it is, driving the car. Um, family life is messy. On the best of days, it's a bit messy. There's, there are big, you know, business leadership is like that. You know, Monday morning, 
typically you face a, some big obstacle that you've got to overcome. Family is no different. Weekend can be great, and then next thing you know, by the end of Monday night, it's you've had some terrible thing. Some out. chaos. Some yep. chaos, right? But what? Um, that's not burnout. That's just life. But um, and then we've had the COVID, all the anxiety, all the. You know, I just notice it when I'm driving. I just feel like everyone's angry with me, and I'm trying to drive. I'm, I can be pretty aggressive actually when I drive, but I'm trying to trying to actually be real careful to mm. sort of annoy too many people. Um, oh, I don't know, I'm rambling now, but the point is, is there anything that you would give us a tip in today's age for dads who are feeling burdened? Yeah, if I could give a couple. Yeah. I think the first is just stay in the game. Right. You know, a big part of our masculine role in this world is being enduring Mm. being people who know how to stick it out, nice. stay faithful, stay in it, even when we feel like we're doing a bad job, we're not. maybe we're doing more harm than good, being present and sticking around yeah. counts for a lot. You know, just a dad who's there. Might not always be there perfectly, mm. but you're there, and that is what really matters. Nice. Um, I think the other is find at least one other dad that you can talk openly mm. and honestly with. You might be the one to have to take the risk. Mm. You no know, vulnerability is most terrifying to dads, mm. you know, but, and you'll realize you're not alone. Whatever mm. you're struggling with, whether it's anger, whether it's pornography, whether mm. it's, you know, whatever it is mm. in your life with your your work or your kids or the frustration or what, mm. you'll find that men all over the place, mm. you are not alone. And mm. so having someone that you can share these things with is half of the battle mm. into overcoming those things. Well. So I'd, I'd focus on those two things. That's awesome. That's great advice, Joel. Appreciate it, man. Appreciate you. Appreciate you making the time for this podcast. Um, I know there's probably a dozen other things that I we could easily talk about, and I'd love to have you back one day. Um, but, yeah, thanks, man. You're welcome. Thanks yes. for having me. Pleasure.